Hey, everybody. Welcome back uh, to the Econ Playground. I'm here back again with Andrew and Caleb, and we're going to keep reading uh, Law and Revolution. This time we're reading chapters three, four, five, and six. And uh, don't want to have too much of an introduction. So each one of us is just going to sort of give a little preface to each one of the sections, and then uh, and then we'll talk about it. Um, so Andrew, why don't you start with chapter three? Great, thank you. Yeah, so chapter three is the origin of the of Western legal science in the European universities. But uh, before I begin, I just want to give a couple of preliminaries. Um, the, I think you notice these sections are, they have immensity of detail. And so I think it's our kind of, um, it's beholden on us to bring out the big picture. But I'd then like to just focus on some details together. You know, if we have a question or some concept, let's, let's go to the text and read out loud and make it make sense to us. And the other thing is, um, we said at the end of our last conversation that we're going to try to pay attention to resources. Uh, the author talks about the, the effort of this book in some way being to find resources to deal with the current crisis in legal thought. So okay, what are the resources in these details that might help us get past the particularities, you know, uh, disconnected particularities. So yeah, chapter three, the origin of Western legal science in the European universities. The question of this chapter is how universities developed the civil and canon law. It's kind of the what and how um, with, with a special focus on, I guess, the civil law in universities and then how that influenced the canon law. So what's the what and how? The basic answer of this chapter is that the universities create some kind of integration via the scholastic method of the study of rediscovered Justinian texts. That is uh, a body of, of, of texts from Roman law compiled by, by the emperor Justinian. And that uh, this study creates a, a character that's distinct from that older Roman law in that instead of being something like a collection of rulings, it creates a science of those rulings, a science or a body, and, and through that science, a sense of a body of law. Um, so the chapter begins with the discussion of the rise of universities and the development of the scholastic method with a special emphasis on this idea of synthesis in the scholastic method. Um, the characteristics it, it emphasizes are the fact that the scholastics had a faith that there was a coherence to be discovered, uh, especially in authoritative texts. So for them, these Justinian texts that were rediscovered um, had almost a sacred quality of belief and a, and a universal truth to be discovered. And But there were seeming contradictions because these things weren't necessarily uh, made into a coherent body in the past, but they had this faith that it could be harmonized. Um, the chapter focuses on the University of Bologna, the discover, where the, the, these legal texts are discovered and, and, uh, and, and where people from all over Europe come to discuss, to discuss and learn about these Roman texts. And then Gratian, uh, who writes a book on, um, well, what's it called here? Something about the reconciliation of discordant canons. It's called the concordance of discordant canons as the foundation of canon law or the beginning of canon law. And I believe Gratian is a Bolognian, uh, Bolognese uh, monk, right? So he's in that, in that milieu. Um, the chapter focuses on, uh, emphasizes the idea that the Justinian texts were very concrete bound, uh, very much a, a collection of, a, an attempt to, to systematize and collect uh, a, a huge array of data that existed in the Roman law, but that it was very contextual, uh, concrete bound network of rules, um, but that the legal science brings it into an abstract understanding of concepts and principles. The chapter goes on to talk about how the study of Roman law became a prototype for modern science. Maybe we can talk about the ways in which that is so. And there's also a theme that there were historical needs that motivated this scholastic approach, and especially to law as well as theology, and that in the realm of law, it was competing jurisdictions. It was the need to somehow 
reconcile and harmonize competing jurisdictions that was compelling this need to synthesize and create principles. I thought it might be interesting to look, we didn't really read them uh, last time, but this chapter kind of explains some of the origin of the 10 qualities of the Western legal tradition that he lists on page eight and nine. Um, so I thought we might just talk about them. I, and I thought they were, this chapter was especially relevant to um, points two through six, but also maybe seven and eight, nine. Um, so the first principle, uh, what makes the Western legal tradition what it is, is that there's a relatively sharp distinction between legal institutions and other types of institutions. And this is where I think the universities and this kind of meta law, the systematization comes in too. The administration of legal institutions occurs on a professional basis. So the universities are pro providing uh, this professional training. Three, there is a concrete sorry, there's a discrete body of higher learning. Okay, universities, right? This is central to that. Four, uh, the legal learning is has a dialectical relationship with legal institutions. So what's studied in the law in the universities gets back into practice. And so there's this relationship between practice and theory. Uh, the law contains within itself a legal science, a meta law by which it can both analyze, be analyzed and evaluated. Five, the Western legal tradition is, uh, law is conceived as a coherent body. That's the systematization. Six, there's an ongoing character and law has this capacity for growth over generations and time. And those just seem fundamentally related to this idea of the university. Um, to some extent, the seventh point of the Western legal tradition, that the growth of law has an internal logic it's not just changed from outside or political factors. Eight, there's a supremacy of the law over political authorities. And nine, um, perhaps the most distinctive characteristic of the Western legal tradition is its coexistence and competition within the same community of diverse jurisdictions and diverse legal systems. And it makes the supremacy of law at its versus people or, or, or institutions both necessary and possible. So um, I don't know how much, I, I think that's a lot of information already. And I think it gives the big picture, I hope. And if I've missed something, please bring it up. Um, and hopefully we can get some more of the details out as we talk about it. But the question I wanted to ask was um, using the text as a basis to answer the question, what's the difference in a, a legal concept that comes about through this scholastic process, a legal principle, I should say, versus what was in the Roman texts, these Justinian texts. What, what differentiates the product of this medieval scholasticism that creates this body of legal principles as opposed to just a, a collection of more or less cohering rules? Um, well, he, the, he talks about that topic more in the next chapter, but it's really in this one that it, it makes sense and it seems to be actually applied. And it's almost as if he, he, he says later, it's something like um, that what they had in the medieval legal tradition that they didn't have in the Roman legal tradition that they were analyzing was the concept that there are concepts or the principle that law is principled. So sure, the, you know, the Roman jurists are, you know, usually judging cases according to similar principles. It's not like the Roman courts were completely arbitrary. That's not what's being claimed but rather what the medieval tradition is able to realize about Roman law is that they were acting according to regular higher principles and that discovering these principles will make the law even more principled, right? And, um, and then so someone's natural objection is, oh, well, why would you wanna make it more principled? Maybe you want the law to adapt, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, to, in order to have a body of law that can be trusted on, relied upon to be regular, you have to have that precept that, that there are principles. You have to hold the principle that there are principles for people to trust the courts to act in a regular certain way. And um, so it makes you wonder too about the, um, the Roman period, um, why if there wasn't this similar type of body of law, in what sense did people trust their courts? Did they trust them merely because they were forced to trust them by the political authorities? Or did they 
sort of tacitly recognized that the court was going to offer them some sort of, of justice. I'm not sure, but um, that seemed, and it's, it's, to, it's not entirely clear yet, even though this is talked about in later chapters, whether this principle that the law is principled had a lot of practical effect on law as it applied on the ground, and it seems to have had some implications later, or if it was merely a sort of the academic concern of the people at the time. This, this principle that the law is principled um, ties back to something that we talked about um, last time, that the idea of Western law is derived from Greek, Jewish, and, and Roman um, philosophical traditions, but it's not any one of them in particular, but it's some kind of synthesis. And so he, he ties this principle that there are principles um, in law as this uh, synthesis between Greek and Roman legal traditions, where the Greeks would have um, the overall arching principles of, of justice or of virtue guide their legal decisions and law as, as law could inform someone's uh, ideas of justice or of, of virtue or of um, what should be handled ethically in a court, but it was not something that was seen as, as binding or as something that would be uh, a final authority in any, any way. Um, and then the Romans uh, system is um, not guided by some kind of overall legal principle. It had principles within it that were scattered and discordant and um, needed to be synthesized in principle, but um, they were very much addressed at particulars without having some kind of overall um, body or structure to them. And so the Western legal tradition takes this Greek idea that you should have overarching principles and then the Roman idea that these um, laws should be tied to particular uh, particulars and, and binds them together such that the laws address particulars but are guided by overall principles that are legal principles as such and guide the entire body or corpus of law that make it a system of laws instead of a collection of, of discordant laws. I guess he, he does use that to make that distinction between legal order and the legal system. And he's like, don't get me wrong, before the period I'm concerned with, they had a legal order. So it wasn't pure chaos, right? But they didn't have a legal system in the sense of a um, self-conscious legal order that can reform itself to be even to be itself even more so in a way. And I guess as economists and as Smith followers, we're very familiar with this idea that the whole is defined by the parts and the parts by the whole, like in, in a social system. So, but it's, it's really not that easy to, that, not that easy to capture, like any body, like a biological system is defined by its parts and the whole also defines and guides its parts. But what's the difference, essentially, he's saying between a biological system and a self-conscious person that I know I have a body and I can fix my body and I can heal myself and direct myself towards my higher purposes. Maybe that's a little bit of the distinction he's making here. It's, it's that, um, yeah, of course there, there was law, there were legal orders, bodies before this period, but none that recognized themselves and maybe recognized their higher purpose such that they could pursue that purpose for its own sake and not stumble into it by accident. Yeah, and what you get out of this self-conscious idea of law is um, there, there are now principles that guide how you should update or reform or tie together your legal system or your legal body as a whole. And so- Including particulars do, and future particulars. Exactly. And so, um, but to do this, you have to be a part of or embody the- um, the spirit of what the law is doing and the principles that are guiding the law, which is why you start seeing, um, or at least a reason why you start seeing the, the need for a university, because there is a need for lawyers, not only to know the laws, but to know the principles that guide the laws so that they can adapt to and properly institute those principles into new particulars as they arise. 
So what's what's motivating people? That you're talking about people coming in droves. He said, I forget the the numbers, but it's been estimated that there were perhaps forty thousand. Is that was that was that a number he gave? He said it's, it's perhaps doubtable, but at least estimates are given that there were um, huge numbers of people coming to 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 study law. At um, Bologna, is that yeah? Oh, that forty thousand is like the size of GMU. Yeah, it's just like crazy, and especially given um, the population yeah. of Europe was small. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. I'll see if I can find that number, but but it, but what's what's going on here is that they've discovered these Justinian texts, right? There are several of them: the Digest, the novels, the um, Institutes, and the Code. And what's primarily of an interest to them is the digest, which are these edicts of praetors, how they would ro rule on various concrete cases. And as you're saying, they, were, they had these assumptions and presuppositions and concepts, but they didn't—they weren't conscious of them. Um, what's so? What's driving the attempt to become conscious about those presuppositions? So you're talking about this 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 benefit. Is that benefit conscious? And to what extent? To what extent is this? A consequence, and to what extent is this uh, an unintended consequence, and to what extent is this a desired end being sought, and in what combination? What's the this that you're referring to exactly? Uh, the, what we were talking about before about uh, this seeing the whole as principles, as a cor as a corpus, uh, unifying and guiding the parts, but enabling this kind of growth and integration of new parts. Um, so one example, it comes out of uh, a future chapter um, in terms of, I think it's in, in, in one of the chapters of what the canon law involves. But for example, um, Gratian in, in uh, reconciling discordant canons takes particular cases of someone dispossessed of their property in this case, or dispossessed of their possessions in this case, and in this case should be repossessed before they can bring legal suit. Uh, and then he, he makes it this general rule. Anyone who's dispossessed um, should be put back in possession of the, of the land before, or, and then, and not just land, because those two things talk about land, but also chattels and other rights and offices, okay? So there's this generalization of principles that helps you decide cases on a principled way. So the question is, is this, um, it has this practical consequence of helping you decide cases in a, in a principled way. But to what extent is that an unintended consequence of a way of thinking or a faith of the time? To what extent is it a conscious desire being driven by practical needs and, and it's, or some combination of those things? I think that um, even if it is a conscious desire, you still have to ask yourself the question, okay, well, why did everyone all of a sudden make that judgment in this time period, right? If we're saying that there was this major shift at the time, um, are we saying it's just random? It came out of absolutely never came out, out of space. Or is there something about the, the practical problems that faced the people at that time that attracted them towards a solution like this? And uh, I'm not totally sure either one. He, he seems to really want this papal revolution to be some sort of what really strong what we'd call exogenous force into the into the system of, of western europe so that he can contrast it with the east but um i'm not totally clear actually i don't know how to i wouldn't know how to answer the question though like can i just i just want to make a side note that the the title of the book concordance of discordant canons it kind of had to be like an ironic joke a little bit right because it's so obviously like a um like a shocker like oh you can you can never actually find concord in discordant canons so in a way someone that it's it's like an ironic title that um people would be very attracted to for uh, either because they think that he's able to like pull off a miracle or because they want to see like little legal tricks that he pulls right like oh there are these two weird legal cases and he finds some like silly principle that happens to find concord between them so there might even be a little bit of an element of humor in there and if i remember correctly i don't remember if it was in this book or another book that that preceded it i think it might have been something that preceded it oh i think it was abelard that had compiled a list of discordant aspects of scripture 
And the idea was to find concord between these apparently discordant aspects of scripture with the sort of axiom that scripture is self-consistent, right? You might, someone might put forward that the axiom that, that this law is, is self-consistent or at least has strong elements of self-consistence. Or it's possible that, that they're holding the axiom that it has consistence, but it really doesn't. And so, but even though they, they hold that sort of faith, they end up finding something that wasn't really there in the first place, but they end up with some coherent overall body. I'm not sure. That doesn't answer your question. Though. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, um, I don't know how I don't know how to assess whether it's ironic or because it's, you know, it might be seeming seemingly discordant. It might be funny. Uh, I, I'm trying to find the pages where he does talk about um, these other scholastic, early scholastic thinkers and what's motivating them. Because it seems to me that uh, one way to approach the question of to what extent it's a an unintended consequence of a way of thinking and to what extent it's practical, it seems like the we'd have to say what's motivating the scholastic mode of thought and, and also uh, then the practical consequences of, of what he, he what he says most importantly is that these competing jurisdictions is kind of um, there's a need there's a growth of of uh, jurisdictions and, and need for resolving legal issues among all these different uh, jurisdictional areas and how those are going to be worked out. But do you, do you remember where he's talking about uh, those other scholastic influences? Is that in the, is that in your is that in the next chapter? Uh, it, might, it might actually be in the next chapter. And even when in all this section where he's talking about the scholastics, I thought it was interesting that he very rarely brings up Aquinas. So Aquinas is possibly just not terribly relevant to his topic or his time period, because Aquinas is the 13th century. And here he's talking primarily about the 11th, 12th century. I, I, but that I method, know. that the scholastic method of proposing these different discordant things and finding concordance in them, you can see a little bit in the way that Thomas writes, which is, you know, him saying some sort of resolved and then the objections to it. And then his replies to those objections is a sort of, oh, there's all these people in a room who disagree. I'm bringing them into concordance. So taking people's theological intuitions and bringing them into concordance, similar to what the legal scholars were doing to law and similar then to what scriptural scholars were doing to aspects of scripture, I suppose. And it, doesn't, it must have some something to do with the attitude towards reason, right? So you've got this faith that, um, that you have this text that is coherent. It has to be because it's the authoritative sacred text. And yet there seems to be com contradictions. Um, and so either by interpretation or, or by, by some kind of reason, you know, reasonable understanding, we need to be able to make the concordance. So there's a faith that there is a principle underlying the, un, un, underlying that that discordance or seeming discordance. Um, one of the things that was striking me as I was reading is how the scholastic mode separates faith from reason and then tries to harmonize them, right? There's this, this is something that's happening in this scholastic episode. It's a, it's a, a it's a, it's an understanding of reason that in some way is distinct from faith. Um, and it's, and it's postulates are, um, who is it? Is it Abelard who, who talks about, um, who, believing in order to understand i believe in order to understand where is that in the you know what i'm talking about i think that might be augustine that says that okay. or was it in the text i forget yeah so it's absolutely here there um i'll have to look for it but did you were you getting that sense too that it's that somehow one of these things driving this scholastic approach is not just the faith in the it's and so um and so. i believe in order that i may understand yeah Wait, what what page is that that is uh page 141 of the book not of the pdf i have a pdf that's more like the book by the way caleb if you want it but yeah okay oh, yeah sure. that's fine yeah um you know when you were just talking there andrew i realized something um that may maybe is points towards the the meta point that he's making in the book, like you were talking about the resources for the common age or the present age. Um, 
where something that we talk a lot about when we talk a lot about the, um, I don't know, who, people who go under the title like a postmodern thinker or something like that. I really don't know very much about those, you know, several French thinkers, Derrida and such, but they're associated with this term, the hermeneutics of suspicion, right? And you, I realized just now that they are kind of doing something similar in that you might find these elements of a text which are discordant and they find a principle which harmonizes those discordant elements, but it's not a reasonable principle. It's a, what they call something like a power principle. So why do, why does this person add these elements to this text? Because they have some sort of goal outside the text and it makes sense that they would want people to follow all of these things according to, you know, the agenda they're pushing. So that has an aspect of this medieval scholastic tradition in that it's it thinks that texts are coherent they're principled in that everything that is in there is in there for a reason but it's not principled in the same way in that that this text is according to some principle of justice that we all should follow but it's according to someone's will there's some will that is making texts coherent uh, it's not some principle Yeah, so it's like doing um, like doing scholastic theology, except not having the idea of natural law, because it's the idea of, of, of God instituted natural law that kind of drives this this need to try to get everything to go here. Um, when you have this multiplication of, of jurisdictions and you've got this idea that um, God has this divine law of what is best for the world and we're trying to align ourselves with that and so natural law supersedes these man instituted forms of law and our their goal is to tr somewhat like get uh legal systems to mirror or match that is at least a sense that i i came away from when reading this and so um maybe pulling away that idea of there being a natural law to form um, legal institutes or uh, legal principles up against is something that modern um, modes of, of legal inquiry are lacking that they had at the beginning that allowed them to, to seek this harmony amongst competing jurisdictions. The faith in a divine order is going to is going to perhaps correlate with the faith that there's order in, in the parts, you know, order in the legal elements. And so discovering these Roman texts that are the way more ordered and um, systematic than anything you've seen before, it kind of gives you hope that you're discovering that divine order in the, in the order of things. You, you're talking about the natural law. Um, Gratian, the canonist, uh, on page 145 and 146, um, he's somewhat responsible, according to Berman, for developing the sense of a hierarchical order of types of law, of kind of articulating and ordering them. So he kind of uh, makes clear that this is this idea of a divine law, which supersedes natural law, which supersedes human law, of which you have church law above prince law, princely law, and that all supersedes custom, right? But that there's some kind of, um, that there's a hierarchy in, inherent in the nature of things that helps you harmonize these different kinds of law. Uh, but he does say that the, the subordination of positive law to natural law is reinforced by the dualism of secular and ecclesiastical law, as well as the coexistence of conflicting secular authorities. Uh, churches claimed secular laws which contradict the law of the church were invalid. Princes did not always yield to that claim. Nevertheless, they themselves made similar claims with respect to laws of competing secular authorities. Given plural legal systems, victims of unjust laws could run from one jurisdiction to another for relief in the name of reason and conscience. And that's relating to what we were reading earlier about this idea that law is, is uh, supreme. Is it, 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 this is relating to um, Professor Dan Klein's interest in kind of this uh, dual monism, right? There's something about having one uh, focal, uh, you know, focal point of the origin and, and definition and judging of the law that kind of creates legal order. But I think Berman is 
might agree that there are aspects of that that are helpful in creating legal order. In another way, it's um, under, it might undermine the idea that there's a law above the sovereign, right? That you're, you're kind of in this positivist law, legal theory, that the law proceeds from a person or a body uh, according to some legitimizing, you know, authori authoritarian, <laughs> authoritative, I guess, process. And what he's saying here is that the Western legal tradition sees law as above any of these particular institutions. It's, a, it's something to be known and studied and, and integrated because it's above any particular uh, legal jurisdiction and harmonizes across them. You, you can think of maybe, I guess, if we have this sort of sense, the, the medieval sort of equilibrium or legal conception was that there are institutions here on earth, but that the ecclesiastical institutions hopefully embody those higher laws and interpret and bring down those higher laws, hopefully. And then the modern conception is more what you're saying that the, the law is more associated with the will of a, um, a God-fearing prince here on earth. That's, and that will of the sovereign is, is our sort of our legal linchpin or the source of our legal order. And the enlightenment and the democratic revolutions that happen afterwards Okay, is that a return to the medieval order where now there's a law that that judges over the sovereign, or is it something more like the people are now the sovereign, where what that that the legal principle that orders everything is the the general will or the will of the people instead of the people merely standing in for whatever the higher legal order is, and the enlightenment seems to be a mixture of all of those senses in that there is a sense of there is a lot of sense of natural law even in people like like Locke and, and Smith and Hume, and even Rousseau to some degree, but there's also this very strong will of the people and popular sense that that is gonna be one of our guiding principles. And then also in a number of thinkers that, yeah, you're gonna have a strong leader and they're gonna be your main source of legal order. And all three of those are um, sort of confused and mixed together. And, and even today, when people look back and there are a number of movements today that look back on the medieval era and think of it as a better legal order or a more coherent legal order. Um, they often refer to uh, monarchy as being that great system that that put one person in charge that and that's everything was ordered when one person was in charge or the Pope when one person ruled the spiritual life of of Europe. That's when everything was ordered. But they don't have this sense of Pope versus King and actually the the two systems and the confusion that's not really what's looked back on but i haven't read their works as much but you you get much more of the sense of oh we need these central single it's it's more uh it feels almost like interpreting the middle ages as being more fascist than it was maybe well and uh it, there may be um authoritarian impulses of popes but but there's but there are limitations that this also comes in the in the couple of chapters from now about the constitution of the church creating limitations constitutional limitations on the on the power of the pope um, both practical limitations and theoretical ones um, and it, but it, but that gracious it does say here there are principles above the pope on some level the pope's the highest judge on a lot of these things so without a um, without a tribunal to judge some of these things, both the Pope, practically he is the final say on a lot of stuff, but that in principle that there, there can be revolution, you know, in, in the church, there can be deposition or of a, of a heretical Pope or, um, so there are principles to be sought um, that are not just the, the consequence of will, but that they're somehow higher than, than will and they're to be discovered through synthesis and, and, uh, and understanding. I still, I still have my original question though of like, what is this? What makes a principle a principle, as opposed to, uh, yeah, what, what, what is the thing that they're achieving? What is the synthesis? It's like a, both a premise and something achieved through synthesis. So, what uh, can we make sense of? Maybe give some examples or. or some theory to what creates the. Principle? It's very, uh, it's very Euthyphro dilemma, you know. In that, yeah, are these principles good principles because they're what the highest principle God says is good, 
or is it because they're emerging out of something else? It's yeah, it is. It's not totally, it's almost like um, the principles are what emerge on the self-reflection of the system. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that in working out, some people realize, well, this judge is operating according to this principle and he shouldn't have because that's discordant with the rest of the system somehow, or this jurist or someone in the past was operating on a false principle. I mean, we have, we totally admit to that nowadays and we have a system of appeals but we just have someone to bottom it out at the Supreme Court. But yeah, I think your question is their question, I think. And your, your way of putting things in terms of, is it, uh, are we discovering something or are we, are we creating something from the system is on page 140, uh, talking about this idea of a maxim. Um, the, the digest had these things called legal maxims um, that were principles of, uh, let's see here, that's 132. Uh, one of the techniques of the scholastic jurists was to treat Roman rules regulae as maxims, as independent principles of universal validity. So in 140, he talks about um, maxim, a maximum proposition, a maxim, is induced that what is said of a species may be said of a genus. It's assumed instead that the whole law, the entire use, could be induced by synthesis from the common characteristics of special types of cases. They had a belief that every legal decision or rule is a species of a genus law. And this made it possible for them to use every part of the law to build the whole, and at the same time to use the whole to interpret every part. Yeah, so the the change that I think we're seeing from from the Roman to um, the, the the Western is, I think the, the the way of how the self referential or the 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 self conscious nature of having a system of law affects how principles in law are understood. So. Um, he talks about how it's not that there weren't principles in the Roman law and that they still had ideas of what property was or, um, or of, of procedure, but that these ideas were scattered throughout and not coherent and that the idea that those principles existed didn't impose themselves on people making future legal decisions. So what change is you you now have like this um genus of law that is is guiding how you speciate throughout um how you come up with a particular answer to a question is now guided by the whole corpus of the law and the principles that guide those laws instead of it being more siloed out or or seen as something that you respond to um, in accordance with just the, the needs of the circumstance, but there's something larger guiding the legal system and that there is a legal system that is guided by something. So, so it seems sense. like the Romans had these species quite well defined. Yes. Right? They have all these species next to each other and, and the scholastics are seeing by induction that there are these similarities and these small, small species sets they're trying to artic articulate what that generality is. They're putting it in a class and then they're saying, look at all the other things in the class. The Romans never talked about those others, other things, but look, it must apply across the board. Again, thinking about the example from Gratian, uh, the rule of, of, I think it was repossession. I think that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. In these cases, someone dispossessed is repossessed before they bring a legal suit. Um, but it actually applies not just to land, but to anything. You know, what's the reason behind it? What's the principle behind it? Um, so th there's this generality from, from land to other things. And what was the other generality there? Yeah, from these particular kinds of uh, dispossessions, even to someone, it talks about how if I dispossess Marcus, 
Marcus is the, the proper owner. I dispossess him. And then he violently dispossesses me of what I was possessing that's really his. So I was the initial aggressor. And Marcus has helped himself by taking back what was his. I go to the court and I say, look, I can show you he just violently dispossessed me of this thing. The court will give it back to me. And then require Marcus to go to the, to the court to, to get the court to give it back. Does that make sense? So, and then the reason there is, is that uh, it, it discourages this violence, right? It creates an orderly process for, for dispute resolution. Um, I mean, that's one of, the, one of the couple of things, right? So th this, this discussion of in, uh, induction to general principles and the application of the general moves on to this, his last part of the chapter. And it's, I'm actually understanding the last part much better now, where he talks about Western law, legal science as a prototype for Western science. Um, so in, in what way would you say that it is a prototype? Um, is this analogy to, I was thinking about like physical laws. You can like look at the induction. You can define the physical case. Think about like, um, projectiles. It always has this motion. It's kind of parabolic. Is it parabolic? Oh yes. We can define a parabola. Oh, now we can know where all of our, you know, projectiles are going to hit. And given these assumptions, we can predict future cases. So we induce, find the rule, apply the rule to, to yet unknown cases. And then we use the laws that we just assume because we observe them so regularly to be to occur in these cases such that we can do uh, experiments that are like speculative in some way, like how they end up doing things with quantum physics, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes those principles actually have to be presumed for you to begin the next experiment, right? But then someone can say, oh, well, they had a whole line of experiments here that were based on a false principle and they have to take back, go back a few steps, but that's how sort of science proceeds. And you can think of, you can think of like uh, Thomas Kuhn's sort of scientific paradigms, like you think of legal paradigms, which, what are the operating principles that are recognized as part of the whole for you know, practical legal purposes in this day and age. And that defines how they understand everything until there's an overwhelming number of anomalies such that one of the principles has to be revised or overturned or a new one has to be introduced. And, and the same works in, in understanding a physical or astronomic system. So you could refer to like Smith's history of astronomy and how, how he, he saw you know, the, the experience of discovering how a system works and using your understanding to, to make judgments about it and discoveries about it for the future. It so I see, yes, I see one. the connection. I and and I, I, I noticed too that I had never noticed this that explicitly before, but the terms that they use in law and then in logic are genus and species, which we now use now, those terms are most common conventionally used in biology. And so I'm curious in what order those proceed is that is genus and species thought of as these logical categories that we assume these biological systems apply to these logical categories or are is the logic and the actual pattern of events due to these initial genetic facts or spirits about the universe that unfold themselves in patterns that we now recognize backwards as logic and charles purse who i read a lot of though i don't understand at all is is very much like um he 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 was very into medieval logic and like refining and understanding medieval logic. And he was writing right after Darwin appeared. And I think in the deep recesses of, of Peirce's mind, he saw some sort of analogy between Darwin's theory of evolution, which is also very similar to this parts defining the whole, whole defining the parts process um, and the way that actual logic and logical science developed and how people understood the world. You had to understand it according to the way that it evolved. There is no other way to understand it. And it's history and the species that arise within the world according to its history and its evolutionary principles unfolding are, are what makes logic work. Like just the way that you structure your mind. So you're structuring your mind according to the way that history and evolution has played out. And that's what makes it true. It's not the other way around. So in a way, biology is the king of the sciences and not physics or something else like we normally say. But that's jumping way too far ahead, I think. But profound and interesting. 
I, I wanted to connect the text to what you were saying a, uh, a moment ago about um, kind of experimentation and like theoretical experimentation. I, I imagine people in general, and I, I would be included in this as I was reading, just the idea of, of treating the social science, quote unquote, or this practical art of law as a, as a prototype of Western physical science or Western. He says he, by science, he doesn't mean just the physical sciences. He, he, he kind of rejects the notion that um, physical science is the only approach. And, and I think he, he thinks the thing that, that uh, changes the notion of science is in the scientific revolution, thinking that you have to mathematize, that the, the, the pro appropriate language is, is, mathem is mathematical. And that's not what he means by, by science. But the, but the idea that you can have experiments in law, like what's the feedback you get? What does it mean to get it wrong? So you say, I think this is the principle that applies. And look, let's apply it in all these cases. Just in the physical sciences, you can apply this Newtonian rule and it turns out, oh, it doesn't work in these relativity or quantum environments. You get some kind of feedback. We have these predictions, we get this kind of feedback. So what's the feedback in law? On page 153, I think he makes it clear that and he actually uses this example of the rule of repossession. He says, in all the various legal systems under examination, the question arose whether one who has forcibly dis dispossessed of his goods has a right to take them back by force. So this is, this is a question that arises in all these legal systems. Um, they find the legal pr principle that we've already discussed. And he says, then they applied it. But here's the feedback. It was further verified by experience including experience of the circumstances that had given rise to the rule, namely the disorder and injustice that resulted when disputes over rights in land, good and chosen, uh, uh, chose as an action are settled by violent acts of dispossession. So it seems like the feedback, the, the, the end of law is order and justice, and that we can kind of see the disorder and injustice that results from a, an, the wrong the wrong principle or or uh, misapplication of a principle what do you think about that? is that a meaningfully scientific thing because it has this value like these values are in there quote unquote justice and order um that's not in the physical sciences right the, the projectile either does or does not hit the 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 ray of light either does or doesn't get to the astronomical body the oh go ahead go ahead okay um the the standard or criterion is less focal but is nonetheless there right so we can still see the chaos that occurs when you have um the the system of everyone taking the law into their own hand to violently repossess um what's been taken from them and so and and that's a particularly easy um, case to see. And so the, the case of, of natural sciences, um, the, it benefits from the, the focality or the clearness of the criterion that you're testing against. So it's very easy to define your criterion when you're talking about some kind of natural science with physics, for example, it's, it's very easy to see whether you were right or wrong in your assumptions or in your, your hypothesis. And it's harder to do that in the legal sciences, but it's nonetheless, I think, still a criterion. Um, but I do think that um, things get harder the more um, disconnected the law gets from um, the, the effect that it's trying to cause. And so you could, think of like the the law of dispossession that you're talking about as having a very clear um cause and effect on um on the world but then something like um like tariffs people had you know, thought that tariffs were good for um domestic industries for a long time and it took people like smith and boss yeah to write about tariffs to to show that they're actually um discordant and they're harmful and so the more ambiguous uh way that laws affect things the harder it is to judge against a criterion but i think there is still i i have started to ramble a little bit 
but there is still something there. I think Jacob Viner, I think it's Viner, and when he talks about the mercantilists in his discussion of Adam Smith and, and Laissez Faire, I think he he says, I wish I had the exact phraseology because it's pretty, uh, it's a great phrase, but it's something about that they derived um, something like false generalizations from apparent facts. You know, it's like they they were they were they were trying to understand the world, but they the complexity of the social order made it very difficult for them to come to correct conclusions. And actually, there was a progression in the mercantilists dealing with prior hypotheses of the phenomena and like integrating towards towards Adam Smith. And then Smith comes along and says, look, he, all of these, you know, he kind of makes that systematic understanding um, breaks through the, the, the apparent chaos to create a, a, a deeper understanding of what's going on. But I think I, guess, I, I understand what you're saying. So. I, I, just to answer the question, I think I'd want to say that it's not totally clear that physical sciences are valueless. I think it's fair to say that they're successful nonetheless, and that we've developed many technologies based on them and seem to understand the order of the universe and predict it better. Um, but so like when, even when Hayek talks about, you know, systems of complex phenomena versus symbols of, of a, you know, uh, simple phenomena. He talks about, oh, well, in the social sciences, we're people making judgments and we're, you know, we're part of the system that we're understanding. So it's almost a recursive thing to say that we understand the whole system and, and why it works the way it does. But with physical systems, these are, are uh, you know, like I can understand a table or I can understand two rocks falling because that's a simple system, right? But the, the whole physical universe you are still a part of and you're an observer too. And I don't want to claim to know anything about advanced physics or anything. I still have these old, these physics books that I got from you a while back, Andrew, that I'm going to work through not in the, in the not too distant future, <laughs> like the Einstein relativity stuff, because I got a little bit interested in it. But I don't, I'm not going to pretend to understand that at this point, but it seems like they've broached a similar wall in... Um, in the physical sciences with things like the observer effect and Heisenberg uncertainty in that people thinking, valuing, acting is part of the world that physicists are interested in and therefore have a little bit of a recursive. They're also just exploring. They're not merely observing. Right? Well, and this, this question of the value values in science is he actually says there, there are three ways in which legal science was a prototype of modern science. The first is this kind of empirical experimental uh, relationship between the general and the particulars. Um, the second is the value code of, of science that, in, um, and I'll say the third because it, um, it's the kind of sociological kind of way that a science scientific community operates that come to its principles. But this second one is the scientific code of values. He says it's a little bit more complicated because in some ways, there was ecclesiastical control of universities, an attempt to kind of suppress heresy. But on another level, these universities were kind of the first environments in which skepticism, open conversation, debate were kind of practiced that became the values of the later modern scientific communities. Um, he talks about the value of code, value code being one, um, research with the values of objectivity and integrity uh, some kind of skepticism, and three, an assumption that the science is an open system that seeks increasingly close approximations to truth rather than final answers, and that science cannot be frozen into a set of orthodox conceptions, but is an ever-changing body of ideas with varying degrees of plausibility. Um, so it's, I guess the, the issue is, what is the truth and the plausibility in law? And is it always a question of, of justice and order? Um, and does anyone not want justice and order? I mean, you don't want a chaotic society of violence, right? Um, and you do want, in general, justice to prevail. And if you got people fighting and justice not prevailing, then you, I guess you'd say that you've not gotten the legal principles right, right? There's, but it's a question of approximation to truth and plausibility rather than kind of a perfect, perfect sense. So there's, there's values in both sets. There's values in the, in the enterprise, but law also has this sense of, of the end or the good being more than just truth, but also justice and order. I guess even in a, in a physical system then, when, you are, when you've reached a point where you say this system 
or these principles that I've discovered, or these laws that I've proposed, make sense of the system, you have some other principle within your system that defines whether or not these principles make sense of it. So there's, they still are all self-contained and there still the is that law. value. Yeah, That's the meta law. So you got the, the meta law is trying to inform the law. The law is practical, it's doing its thing. And then you're finding out whether that's making sense or not. You have reflection. And this is, this is the role of the university. People are coming in, they're learning the principles that have been learned from practice. Mm -hmm. They're going back into practice. And it's you kind of have this recursive spiraling forward in, in the development of these things. Um, yeah, Peirce cool. actually says that logic is the only science. He says something like that. There's only one science and it's logic, which is the, the knowledge of what principles you should discipline your thoughts with. Everything else is an application of logic. So in that sense, but, but he also thought of logic as a science that you're, you can reform. He just thought it reformed much slowly over time, the science well, block. And it, well, it depends also what is meant by logic there, right? You were kind of talking about this evolutionary empirical element, or I think maybe. But yeah, that for them, like their system is both making sense of the data. It's making the data coherent as cases, but it's also then relating to empirically new cases. And 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 so there is this um, dialectic and, and new synthesis um, by induction to synthesize to God's principles. <laughs> it's like they're there. It's like the faith that they're there and you're trying to approximate them and find them by induction and synthesis and then this kind of experiential cycle. I'm wondering, we've been talking about this first chapter quite a while, so I'm wondering if we want to move to the next chapter. And um, Yes, but let me ask one more question about this section before we move on, because it's about universities. It's not just so this is a more of a historical um, observation that I think is interesting. The I wasn't totally clear from the chapter how church like because the, the 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 universities were they were clearly sponsored heavily by the church and regulated to some degree by the church and sort of granted a spirit and an authority from the church even. But um, like many universities were in the modern era as well, right? But um, but I didn't get. I I got. I I I get a little bit of a sense that the universities were to legal science what the monasteries were to spiritual science or something like that. So the um, you can think of monks as being all of these Christians all around the world who are realizing that salvation and there's a way to, you know, live your life that elevates yourself and, you know, brings you closer to God in a number of ways, but that none of their particular locations made them subject to particular errors. So what a monastery is, is, is it's an escape from any particular place to a place where you can collect all of the spiritual wisdom and maybe discover new things yourself and debate with other people, discuss with other people what what is meant by the experiences that you're having and try to generate spiritual knowledge that can then be exported into the rest of the world. And that the university might be a similar thing for the more legal, uh, practical sciences in the same way that monasteries were for a, a spiritual science. And that was one of the um, criticisms that I got from a scholar named Ian Gurdon on my paper, because uh, I've been working on a paper on monasticism. And my main point was, oh, what the monastics provide is an impartial check on, on bishops and the church hierarchy. But he said, what, he's, a, he's a scholar of monasticism. He said that one of the biggest things that they're attributed with is, in a sense, being producers, if we're thinking of them in an economic analogy, they're producers of some sort of spiritual good or spiritual human capital. And um, that they could only produce in these very particular spiritual conditions, namely the desert or the top of a mountain or wherever the monastery is separated from the secular world. Um, and universities might be a similar thing. And just the structure of the university reminded me of internal um, monastic politics. It's like this place that people go to very intentionally um, and, they, and they have a very peculiar fervor to them because they're bringing all of these local issues um, and hoping to generate one product together, a universal general vision to export into the world. And that's the same way that, that you know, non-religious people treat universities today. This is a place that I'm going to go with my local problems and we're going to do all kinds of stuff. And then we're going to produce 
I guess, you know, now that I think about it, the, one of the parts of the university we haven't talked about is the m medical degrees. They were also offering medical degrees and that's like a phys that's a that's a physical science. So they had the legal, theological and the medical parts of each university. And each one of them is has a very similar sense here that you have to go to this particular place to focus on the principles that govern these things everywhere and then we can export them right and then monasteries were that for for a sort of spiritual discipline so universities are that for the legal me medical and, and theological even though i think theological was a, a side thing it seemed in the universities so, but um, yeah so the university of paris is focused on theology and the university of bologna is focused on law and that's kind of their and they're they're two of the very earliest european medieval universities um so I, I actually was following a lot of the points you were saying as interesting, but you started by saying you had a question, but I, I missed the question. Do you still have a question about that or what's the question you have? I, yeah, I guess I don't. I, oh, oh, my question was how m monastery like were the universities in terms of their structure and their self conscious purpose? Yeah, that is a question I also have and I'm interested in. I mean, I think uh, well, it's interesting that at some point they become understood as underneath clergy right so they the students get the benefit of clergy and and, uh, and fall under canon law to a great extent um but i don't think he goes into that enough um to for me for us to be able to answer that here but he does talk about how the university of bologna was distinct from other universities that it was a student-led effort to become a corporation that was really a corporation of students that had kind of had monopsonistic power in some ways over the professorate, um, at least at first, whereas in Paris and elsewhere, the form of the corporation was in the form of the masters. Uh, and that uh, and that even though the legal process of study was imitated, he saw, he says, it went to Padua, uh, Perugia, Pisa, Salamanca, Montpellier, Orléans, uh, Prague, uh, Vienna, Krakow, etc., Heidelberg, they did not accept the student governed process. <laughs> like, so that, like the government system in, in uh, student government in, in Bologna is not imitated elsewhere, even though the legal science is. And I think, I mean, it may be interesting to people to have, uh, if you're interested in the origin of universities, he just has this few pages on the origin of Bologna that's quite interesting, but, but I don't know. It's a good question. Should we, should we go to the theological? Yes, let's do it. Um, What's the name of the, of the chapter that you're, you're doing next, sorry? Um, I think it's the origins. Yeah, theological sources and the, like origins of Western legal. Every, every single chapter in this book is subtitled the origins of the Western legal tradition. Or the sources. So no, we had the yeah. origin of the Western legal tradition in the papal revolution. Then we had the mm -hmm. origin of legal science. Mm -hmm. Now we have the theological sources of the Western the of the Western legal tradition. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, he he. I'll just touch on some of the major themes or, or points that I saw that were very interesting to me in this section. And yeah, for most of it, he's talking about the the main theologian that he really talks about is Anselm. And like I said, he 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 doesn't he doesn't mention Aquinas too much, which might be I don't know if that's because he doesn't think Aquinas is all that important or because um, it just doesn't fit with the timing or the topic of the book. But um, with Anselm, he talks um, about how Anselm out of a, just a desire to, to offer some sort of reasoned, um, you know, re reason to believe in the, the, the incarnation or the doctrine of incarnation has this sort of um, what seems like a legal interpretation of how salvation works in that man created God to not sin, man sinned, and ought to be punished for transgressing what what god intended right and that, that that's uh, that that's somehow just so some punishment must be doled out um to counterbalance the the sin that 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 man did and um but that god out of his mercy wanted to extend something to um to to ameliorate this so he put himself in the form of his son that took the punishment and solved sort of the issue. So the sin was paid for, a punishment was given by the sin to a human who was also the gift totally of God. And that this 
is what solved it. And this is, he's, he does all this just to sort of recommend why from reason something like the incarnation must have happened or that we must put forward something to, to that, that God must have taken some action like this out of his nature. It just makes sense. But what it comes along with is this sense of um, the nature in which um, God deals with sin or the nature of how you should respond to sin, namely um, I sin and then you punish the sin. The proper response to sin is punishment. And so it comes along with a couple things, um, even though it does say that this doctrine is called um, penal substitutionary atonement, which is uh, definitely not accepted in the East. And he even says that the Roman Catholic Church is not a terrible big fan of it either. And they don't formally accept it in any way, but it, it comes to influence them a lot. So there was, there's a big, there's a major focus in somewhat in Catholic, but later very much in Protestant theology, that the crucifixion is a very, very big focus. Like Christ's work was done somehow on the crucifixion, where in the East, the sense is that the crucifixion and the resurrection and all of Christ's life, even uh, events like the transfiguration, which don't get as much uh, emphasis other, other places, are all under one big tent. The, the whole life of Christ, the whole incarnation is the important thing. Whereas here, the crucifixion and this sort of legal tra uh, transactional uh, vision of what happens in salvation is what's important. And the way that that gets sort of exported into the legal sciences is the idea that that when someone commits a crime or com someone commits a sin, the proper response is to punish it. And this is the um, what's called the retributive theory of justice or the retributive theory of sin and um, that that continues down um, into the future. And um, and and Anselm, just for a little bit of extra uh, historical context, was one of the first um, archbishops of Canterbury after 1066. He took after a guy named Lent Frank, who came who came over with uh, William the Conqueror and helped uh, establish a lot of monasteries in England. And Lent Frank was you know, is associated with the what's now called the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is applying a sort of a legal or a sort of Aristotelian set of concepts to the Eucharist and what's happening there, um, which is also a sense of doing theology that is not accepted in the East that Len Frank and Anselm are doing right around the time that the schism and right around the time that the papal revolution that we're concerned with is happening. Um, and then I, I wrote down a couple of things here that we, we covered in the last section, but um, yeah, I think the, that what's, most interesting here or the most interesting thing parts that I found in this chapter were actually right towards the end um, where he says, I'm just going to read this section. This is on page uh, 197. He says, in the 16th century and thereafter, the legalism of the Roman Catholic Church was subjected to sharp attack by various forms of Protestantism. Martin Luther denounced the concept of a visible corporate church united by law. He burned the books of canon law, partly in order to symbolize his belief that the true church can have no legal character, whatever, that it is an invisible communion of the faithful. Nevertheless, Luther also had a passionate belief in the value of law, that is the secular law of the prince, the law of the state, which he simply assumed would be the law of a Christian prince. Thus, the Roman Catholic belief in the infusion of divine and natural law into legal institutions was carried on by Lutheranism, uh, but only into secular legal institutions and not into ecclesiastical. The church henceforth appeared as a purely spiritual community coextensive with a particular secular order, whereas between the 11th and 15th centuries, many secular orders had coexisted and interacted with the Una Sancta Ecclesia. And um, it, so it, it seems like what he seems to be saying, he, he's jumping forward than the time period that he's concerned with. And so I don't entirely trust his, his interpretation or his discussion of Luther, just because I, I'm not sure that that totally characterizes Luther's theology, but it seems to be in, in the absence of the way that the medieval legal order worked, you can see really what its emphasis was, was that there's these, these multiple authorities, the ecclesiastical courts and the secular courts, both sort of interacting and cooperating or um, competing with one another and that when and and that the the bo both were very much defined by this strict sort of um, understanding uh, strict like legal rules and, and almost casuistic rules to some degree and that in the Protestant Reformation Luther said that's totally inappropriate for the church but he doesn't make it clear that that's totally inappropriate for the secular authority and so 
things that were previously in the sort of negotiation between church and state were left to be judged by the church. Um, all of a sudden, that aspect of the legal order has disappeared. And so now the Christian prince and that character becomes the new person that is supposed to order that part of the world. And they're supposed to do it with, you know, in the fear of God, respecting God, but they do it. Um, they, they don't have, they themselves are supposed to be that um, legal authority or, or ordering authority. And, um, and of course he doesn't mention, but someone like Calvin was a lawyer himself. And so even more so um, put that, that, sort of lawyer's mind to theology and to structuring everything under um, the, you know, on earth, there's going to be one authority representing God, which is our understanding of the legal system that's given to us by scripture and that we're going to enforce uh, in this area. And, um, um, and to just the last thing that I want to say is that the, the last couple paragraphs is um is I think where he really summarizes what he says in the whole chapter. So I'll just read those quickly. This 20th century development, or it, it is only in the 20th century that the Christian foundations of Western law have been almost totally rejected. The 20th century development is a historical consequence of the Western belief of which St. Anselm was the first exponent that theology itself may be studied independently of revelation. Anselm had no intention of exalting reason at the expense of faith. Yet once reason was separated from faith for analytical purposes, the two began to be separated for other purposes as well. It was eventually taken for granted that reason is capable of functioning by itself. And ultimately this came to mean functioning without any fundamental religious beliefs, whatever. By the same token, it was eventually taken for granted that law as a product of reason is capable of functioning as an instrument of secular power disconnected from ultimate values and purposes. And not only religious faith, but all passionate convictions came to be considered the private affair of each individual. Thus, not only legal thought, but also the very structure of Western legal institutions have been removed from their spiritual foundations, and those foundations in turn are left a devoid of the structure that once stood upon them. And I think to add on to the everything that we were saying in about the last chapter, that you have to have a faith that there are principles um, and, an, and an order that structures these things, I think you actually have to believe that there is a, a world or a future world um, that is possible to bring about by following the belief that there are, that the, the law is principled and that there are ultimate principles guiding it. So there's somewhat of an eschatological um, faith that you need to have in addition to, I don't know what you'd call it, a faith in principles or a faith in the, the possibility of order it's it's you actually have to have to have to have a faith in the possibility of that order coming about and um part of it there's some reality to the ultimate values and purposes whether, whether or not it's yes. a, to uh a, a here but not a realized or a, or a yeah or, or it, to come but the, it, the, this this relates to our last conversation about uh the crisis that he's talking about and and it, it's kind of re-echoing the the nature of the crisis as he sees it what I found fascinating about it is that it's um, it's this scholastic mode that both creates the body of the Western legal tradition and sows the seeds of its destruction. Right? It has this it has this arc that somehow there's a separation of the legal order into into law as a distinct body, and in theology, likewise, faith and reason are somehow analytically separate. And then they have this interesting dialectical relationship with one another, but they kind of separate. And so then you have this, this belief ultimately that reason doesn't have these uh, value premises or these, um, I, and I want to actually add to that. I think one of the things that helped me or that I think is pretty important for this chapter is that right at the beginning, Berman says that he has this theory that metaphors become analogies, become concepts. So, and, and the, there are these religious metaphors. That's why this theology matters for the development of legal concepts, because it's with these religious, it's with these theological metaphors that become theological analogies that become legal concepts. Um, that that you get the separation of the metaphor. You just you start you end up with concepts as if you you didn't start with metaphor, as if there's something that's inarticulate that's being made concrete. It's like you can just skip right to the concrete. Um, 
and that it starts on, he says on page 175, there's a new kind of a new approach to theology. The, the term theology was coined by um, Abelard, who's, who's uh, in the late 11th century, early 12th century, as a systematic study of the evidence of the nature of the divinity that separates this faith. He says for, for Augustine, theology meant divine wisdom. And it involves prayerful reflection on the meaning of Holy Scripture. Um, and mystical intuition of God and his attributes. To a lesser extent, it had uh, an interpretation of decrees of church councils, etc. But theology in the new sense is a rational and objective analysis and synthesis of the articles of faith and the evidence of their validity, beginning with Anselm, by reason alone. The new theology so this, it's, it's interesting that, that, that this, it's both this fruitful, but, but kind of uh, imperfect organism. You know, it's, it's like it has this, this path of, of, of growth and decay in it. The, that general thesis that, that this mode of thinking is both what created and destroyed, um, I guess, Christianity in the West, not utterly destroyed, a weakened Christianity in the West is um, the same thesis that Nietzsche has. And he says something like Christianity inspired science, which is the sword by which it, you know, killed itself eventually. And so that's attitude, a certain attitude yeah. towards science. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and that is the way he thinks. And uh, Caleb can correct me on this, but the, I think in, in the East, there's three saints that are given the title theologian. One of them is St. John the Theologian, who's the uh, Apostle John, and then um, Simeon the New Theologian, and then one other. But one of those two is not at all what we would think of conventionally as a theologian, but was more like a beggar. And But he's, he's called the Theologian, one who knows God or has under, a knowledge of God. And I don't know, do you know, do you remember the name of the third, Caleb? Uh, Gregory the Theologian. Right, right. And he, he's, what is he? He's fourth century? Yeah, uh, yeah, mid to late fourth century, I think. Yeah, um, and then not to to wander off too much, but also the on the topic of the West sowing the seeds of its own destruction, or Christianity in the West doing that, um, it's not very different from what Tom Holland said about liberalism as well as as opening the door for the creation of secular space, creating this secularism that becomes atheistic and as like this check or, or thing that runs against Christianity and ultimately runs against it is also like present in, in his work. So it's interesting to see Berman, Nietzsche and Tom Holland all kind of like coming to this similar conclusion coming from very different avenues of how it's taking place. Um, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, but it's, it's interesting to see um, that they take different routes to come to very similar conclusions. But, um, but Berman's interest is not so much the question of the, you know, the moral and the, and, you know, and the theological, but the legal, right? Yeah. And to reemphasize something we said last time, what he said at the end of the introduction, is that um, the theory of law has to move beyond the Western legal tradition and study non-Western legal systems and traditions to create a common language, a common legal language for mankind. So there, he's seeing, he's trying to find out now that we're, we're in a kind of a global world where Christianity is not the, you know, not the presumed or, or certain views of Christianity even are not the presumed foundation. Is there, can we find the vast, can we find the resources or the values to deal with this kind of new world? So he's, He's looking at the decay of this legal system, you know, the foundation and, and its decay in, in this arc. Um, not that it's dead, but that it's dying and, and in danger, he's afraid of. Um, but so then the question is, can we replant a new seed with, you know, with what's there? Is what's the, what's the new phase that gives it life and vitality and, and adaptation? And is it alive you, enough to have it keep on growing? But yeah, is that more like a rhetorical question or are you actually looking for- I think that's uh, his question. I yeah. think that's his question. And that's the question that's also interesting me in, in terms of what's the practical import of this. Um, I mean, I, it's interesting that I think maybe 
because you, you, you guys both focus kind of on a more Eastern theological basis, right? And uh, it's, it's interesting how the theological metaphors that give birth to the Western legal tradition, which I think we value and are, are interested in, aren't necessarily theological beliefs that we would go in for or emphasize, you know, so like the metaphors that create this valuable system perhaps uh, aren't, aren't uh, you know, it's, the, the, for example, Ans I think it's Anselm. Is it Anselm's the theory of atonement you were talking about? Yeah. It, it's very much based on, he's a contemporary, you said, as you said, of, of the Norman invasion. He, he, he takes over after, uh, Lem, what's his name? Len Frank. Len Frank. Yeah, who the, and they were both um, compatriots in, and the compatriots is not the right word. They were both monks in the monastery of Beck, which is in Normandy, right. where William right. of Normandy was. So then, but so he has this kind of feudal vengeance theory of justice. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of this Germanic infused understanding of, of maybe what God is and what, what justice is. And if God's just, and you have this kind of Germanic vengeance sense of what justice is, this is a retributive balance, then you impute that to God, right? So it's kind of, in some way, the, the time-bound secular influencing how you think about the divine rather than the reverse. Um, but so this, so the, it's this nature of theology that separates faith from reason as distinct that, that kind of creates this illusion of this thing called reason that is somehow without faith. And then can, can reason be reestablished on faiths, perhaps not, not the particular faiths and metaphors that, that existed um, in the 11th century, but other faiths and values and metaphors that can speak to people today, kind of the, can revivify this kind of tradition or give birth to a new phase of it that's kind of a new organism that, that takes the material of the past and, and does it's kind of a, a similar organic whole building adapting functions and it's and it's interesting to see how that that inner relationship the the interplay between legal traditions and theology kind of works itself out in some of the examples that he uses in the chapter. Um, like the example of purgatory is, is really useful in, in saying how this works out. Like um, the creation of this space where you're allotted certain temporal punishments on the basis of the um, the badness of, of your sins. And so the role of baptism being washing away original sin to save you from destruction, but then this preservation of a, a legal system that's a divine legal system that God's imposing to satisfy his wrath. And so this, this entire space in um, theology is created so that you can, that incorporates this idea of this coherent integrated legal system that god has that is actively working throughout our our lives and so it's just um it's very interesting to, to try to think about what was influencing what and which whether the theology pushed the, the legal developments ahead or if it was the legal developments that allowed for the theology to take place, which then reinforced the legal tradition again. But just to see the, the mutual reinforcing of the, the theological beliefs with the legal structure and background that has taken place and is really fascinating to see him work through that. I, I, have, I do have a question that relates to your, what you were talking about. He talks about um, an understanding what the nature of the last day of judgment is, how that informs a sense of purgatory and kind of, and, and the atonement all these three, those are the three main things that he talks about having uh, implications for, for um, the legal tradition, Western legal tradition, um, and this kind of retributive sense of what justice is. There's, I was somewhat uh, unclear on what the relationship between sin and crime is, because he seemed to be saying at once that it was the church's understanding that crime is sin, 
uh, it's not maybe not all sins are crimes, but the crime is sin that gives some of its character to the to, to Western criminal law. But that at the same time, there are other factors that cause the uh, legal procedure and understanding to make a distinction between crime and sin. How, how what's the relationship between sin and crime in this Western legal tradition? Why in what way are they unified and in what way are they distinguished according to Berman? I think maybe, you know, starting on page 185 is, is uh, a particularly, you know, that, that section on the, on the canon law of crimes, I think is where he starts talking about these, the connection and distinction between sin and crime. Yeah, he, he seems to, to have the idea that prior to the Western legal tradition, these things are seen as very much one and the same, and that there is some separation of what it is to be a sin and what it is to be a crime. Um, I did not exactly follow all of it. So the, the, the first part, isn't it, that um, earthly punishment and purgatory have a divine justice role insofar as there are still actual sin that have been committed, you're bringing things back into balance. You're helping the soul of the sinner pur you know, purge this uh, separation from God through punishment. And, and it's the proper punishment that puts things back into balance. So it's really important that punishment is of sin and sin is you're purged of sin through proper punishment and there's a balance that's put in place. And at the same time, as you're saying on 185, he says, a sharp procedural distinction was made for the first time between sin and crime in the 11th century and, and the, and the you know, canon law. So this, this is kind of a, this weird tension. I don't know how, how it goes together. And now, so it, do, we, do we not see that in non-Western legal traditions? A distinction between, or in, I mean, I suppose it would only really matter in like the Byzantine or the other, um, like Russia, like early medieval Russia and that church, did they not make a distinction between crime and sin? I'm not sure. Well, he definitely that would be something it wasn't made in the West prior to the 11th century. Okay, was, at least, yeah. yeah. I, th I think he does imply that that was something that existed within Byzantium was this uh, overlap between crime and sin of the, uh, maybe I'm thinking more um, just secular legal authority and religious legal authority and not necessarily that doesn't necessarily have to overlap with crime and sin but I think he does see that as something that happens in not only pre uh, pre schism west but also um, in Byzantium throughout its history but I'm not positive I, I can say that in this section he talks about how the church to have jurisdiction over crime it had to be a grave sin uh, a mortal sin rather than a venial sin so a pardonable one and it, there had to be a sinful act rather than just a thought because only god could see directly into the mind and heart of the soul of a person and so the church does not adjudicate matters that are hidden right so the, the sense that um there's a, there's a sense that you can't actually deal with the sins directly. You can only deal with the outward signs. And so there has to be an act and that the, the jurisdiction of criminal, the criminal ecclesiastical law or canon law is with the outward. Um, the human judges only know what's externally manifested. Um, and that... Uh, Well, isn't the internal that the, the church, like, for example, in confession is primarily concerned with, like an internal sin is something that that um, you would go to your, your priest to confess. So that is the jurisdiction of the church in a sense. But it's by they, confession and absolution. Mm -hmm. And right. not in their court system. And, and, the, and the thing that the, that the, the penitential law that's not the criminal law of the church, quote unquote, is still punitive. Like go do these things instead of just in the re rectifying, 
and then the and then the priest he says in this time comes to be able to say te absolvo right i absolve you instead of just god doing it the priest does it but it's in the it's in the criminal it's in the criminal jurisdiction that this because i guess in the confession the person tells you what's going on inside right and you you rectify it through some kind of uh, penitence and punishment and, and absolution but in the case of a crime you have someone who's killed someone else you have someone who's killed a, a cleric or um or his uh you know some 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 uh what is it what's the word he uses some mortal sin that's outwardly manifest and that and that t- ties in with the church's interest or or, found, or or basis there's a there's a place for criminal jurisdiction and there's this distinction between what God knows and what the man and what man knows. And man can only deal with the outward signs. Um, and yet, so this, and then there's a third, there's a third tension, which is the subjective existence of sin is necessary for the crime. So it's not just the outward act that's being worked on. There's he's saying the canonists developed all kinds of subjective qualities of what makes a crime a crime. What kind of intent was involved? Were you did you intend it or not, right? So that the sin element is still necessary and ha- somehow it needs to be found out. But I'm just unclear. Maybe we can read some passages or, or maybe we can move on. I don't know what you want to do, but um, how, well, how is it? And this second tension is probably, I think, more interesting to me. How is it that the canonists are deeply concerned with the subjective qualities of mind in a crime and, and work out what are the things they work out and have to define subjectively? But at the same time, deal with the outward manifestations rather than what only God knows. Is, am I, is my question making sense? And is it or not so much? Doesn't seem like. <laughs> could, could you clarify it? Okay, well, let me see if I can find see if I can find the text. I just read to you the the, the part about um, this distinction being made on page one eighty eight of God only seeing directly into the soul and that man deals with the outward manifestations of the act, right? So there's a way in which the court is dealing with the outward and not with the soul. Um, but later it talks about how canon lawyers had to deal with the soul and inquire into the soul. And that was the, fun, that was the ultimate interest of the court and how they worked out, um, he, he says on page 192, that the canonists developed a, a um, they systematically analyzed the precise state of mind of the actor, what he calls the subjective aspect, and of the detailed circumstances of the act, the objective aspect. Um, Roman criminal law was not greatly concerned with the moral quality of the specific criminal act. It was concerned rather with what it called what would be called today the protection of interests and the enforcement of policies. But the church was interested in both the subjective and objective uh, aspect of crime. And I think this is in the next um, chapter perhaps, but it's very relevant here, that they say that the ecclesiastical courts were often offered for use or available for use if somebody wanted to bring their case to it, but they were really only intended for cases where you thought that justice hung in the balance, right? So you could actually bring your case to an ecclesiastical court without without all of the parties consenting to it because the the priests or the, the church is holding the position that the secular courts might not have these same higher goals. The secular courts might just be replicating what the Roman courts were like, trying to protect interests and enforce policies rather than trying to do this big project that we're all on board with ostensibly of integrating all of the all of the principles into one legal order or God's order or ordered plan. And so putting the ecclesiastical courts there as a as a service is essentially supposed to offer that. Now, whether or not a particular ecclesiastical court is actually going to give a more just ruling than any particular secular court is another matter. But the fact that that was the goal that was put forward, I think is um, very important. Yeah, I think this is is playing into the the balance and tension between various different legal systems and how 
the ecclesiastical one is the one that can that has space to incorporate the more inner motives of the criminal or of the uh, the situation that's at hand and things where um, reliance more on strict uh, objective or external um, evidences are, are resigned to the secular courts. And so having the option of, of choosing ecclesiastical or secular courts um, allows people to use the specific court that they need when it best suits their, their case. But I think he's, he's uh, emphasizing that interplay that you get within the Western legal tradition that you don't have within the Roman legal tradition. So I think that's what he's trying to. Well, I can't find it, but also just a practical modern manifestation of this is different degrees of murder, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea of manslaughter and, and the idea of negligence. So strict liability versus negligence um, and degrees of murder, those are, on some level, it's not about what happened outwardly, it's about did this person plan the act maliciously? Are they just angry? Are they, are they, did, did they make a wrong choice that resulted in a death? So it's not, it's not just the outward thing, it's the inward that matters. And that there are different degrees of punishment based on the different degrees of, of malicious intent uh, that somehow has to be known and devised outwardly and understood through the, the inquisition of the, you know, the inquiry, I shouldn't say inquisition, it's not what he's talking about, not the Spanish inquisition anyway. Um, the inquiry of the court is to find out what the facts of the case were and, and also to get in, inside the mind of the, of the person to some degree. So I, I still don't know what the, what the exact relationship of this tension is, how it's, they're, they're focused on the outward, but also more interested in the inward. I'm not quite following what Berman has to say about that. I am conscious that, that we're, again, I'm wondering if we want to move forward or soon to the, the next couple of chapters because we're coming up. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and move to the next couple of chapters just to, uh, to get out what, what the, the final couple of things out of there, yeah. So we're going to talk about two chapters about what the, the, the nature of the, can, the canon law was, right? Yeah, um, and so it's the nature of the canon law and then how that relates to and gets separated from the, the secular law. And um, I think it would actually be helpful to just read this first sentence in the, the beginning of chapter five, to sort of frame this, um, starts by saying, to assert that a system of canon law was created or to put it another way, that the law of the church became systemized for the first time in the century and a half between 1050 and 1200 is not to deny that a legal order existed, had existed in the church from its early beginnings. And so uh, this is useful and, and kind of relates back to what we've been talking about, but um, what he's trying to get at when he's talking about the Western legal system. And, and the, the title of this chapter is Canon Law, the First Modern Western Legal System. And so it's a system as such and not just um, a legal order. And so he describes the, the early church legal order as, as you know, incorporating um, various council rulings and, and dictates from uh, councils and, and then the Bible and, and various legal influences on how the church should govern itself, but that they're not a coherent and organized self-referential body of text that's organized as having a distinct jurisdiction over what is the, uh, the religious or what is the church. Um, and so says that there are interrelated elements, the, the periodization of uh, into old and new law, there's a summarization and integration uh, of the two into a unified structure. And then the conception of a whole body of law as moving forward in time. And it's an ongoing process um, as defining the Western legal tradition. Something he sees as special about canon law is that it's seen as being more more incomplete than um, the secular law that 
they inherit from the code of Justinian. So they get the Justinian code and it's seen as being very complete and final. And the work that they're doing is working out and understanding the synthesis between the various aspects of it and getting it to go here, but it's essentially um, a finished project. And with canon law, um, they see this as being something that is more incomplete, less worked out. They're not pulling from a, I, I think there are hundred, uh, how many, uh, thousands of, of pages of, of codes for the codes of Justinian. They, they have a lot to work with and they just have to tie it all together. But with um, canon law, they're still very incomplete and scattered and disparate and um, not fully fleshed out uh, law that they're working with. And so that gives them more space to, to organically produce it consciously. Um, and, and let me comment on that. He says that they were very conscious of this development as being the new law that largely comes from the Pope. And then there's this old law, which Gratian becomes the master. Uh, his book is recognized to be the central systematizer of what's come before that era, right? Yeah. Um, and then one thing that I think uh, is, is interesting, and then I'll kind of stop this uh, summarization. We can start getting into some, some questions and stuff. But this line on 206, um, where uh, Berman is talking about uh, Pope Gregory, where uh, once he was Pope, his opinions and matters that came before him as Pope uh, were to be preferred in Gratian's phrase to those of such uh, revered theologians as St. Augustine and St. Jerome. But Gratian added, in matters concerning the interpretation of scripture, the opinions of St. Augustine or St. Jerome were prefer uh, preferred to those as of the Pope after all, segregation, the Pope might be a heretic. And so we see this separation between um, ordination and jurisdiction of this divine um, role in what you're doing in the church, this spiritual uh, care that you're providing, the administration of the sacraments, the, the helping of the people, and then this legal code um, and role that you're performing um, as being uh, distinct. And so the uh, jurisdictional aspects refer to your authority, um, your organizational capabilities and, and things that are related to your role as such, as opposed to these ordination, uh, the roles that you'd have with ordination um, that relate to your carrying out of the sacraments or of, of caring for the people. And so um, it's this new distinction that comes with this elevation and of, of law within the church and then this specification of what law is for canon law as opposed for secular law. And, and the jurisdiction becomes a, a, a thing that needs to be defined because of these competing claims to be the the executors of law, right? You've got the secular versus ecclesiastic and various parts of the secular. And so this necessity to systematize and define the jurisdiction arises out of that uh, competing and, and potentially overlapping or conflicting jurisdictions, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you have to work out what it is to be a canon law as opposed to secular law. Right. And then the last chapter was was about uh, the various subsets of the canon law and what its elements were based on how how it got their how it got its jurisdiction right um, from from its power over sacraments it gets control of the law of marriage from its power over uh, last testament it gets power over inheritance uh, in its control over benefices uh, it gets control to some degree over its own pro over its own property and other property laws. Insofar as oaths are holy, it has some control over, you know, oaths and promises, gets control over contracts to some degree. And insofar as it has jurisdiction over sins, it has some jurisdiction over crimes and torts. And that last chapter goes into the details of how it expands its jurisdiction from these uh, sense of ecclesiastical responsibilities to legal, you know, canon law jurisdiction. 
You have, you have questions about these sections or something we want to talk about? I'm not totally sure how much the jurisdictional aspect also comes out of the fact that in the West, the church has a lot of secular interests in terms of they own a lot of land and the 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 papal lands and like the pope the papal states as a sort of a secular body is something that um like the fact that even in in conquest um in the domesday book which is one of the best resources that we have on medieval england which is what william the conqueror uh basically asked to be compiled after the conquest to sort of get a lay of the land that he just conquered a lot of the the entries are like this land is ruled by this bishop or this land is ruled by this monastery so the fact that they are very significant that that's a very significant role like a direct role like that like land management of the church in the west is also very important but in my impression the that was also true in the east that a lot of monasteries and a lot of bishops did just directly own a lot of you know, agricultural land in the Byzantine Empire. So I'm not totally sure if that is a major difference. And it would be interesting to see how they dealt with that role differently in the East and the West, if they don't have this kind of unique can uh, canon law system. Especially with regard to uh, benefices, right? That's the giving That's the giving of property, right? To the church or, or and to charity through the church on some, some level. Yeah, he, he does say on page two, 237, when he talks about the con canon law of property that the church was estimated to have a quarter or a third of the property of the landed property of Europe. So both internal dealings and then uh, people trying to give land and give property to the church um, gives them this, this question of jurisdiction and that they develop a theory of, uh, there's this competing desire to control who gets to control land, right? Both through inheritance and through uh, you know, uh, giving. And that they come up with this, this uh, process of the trust or the charitable trust as a way to somehow harmonize, somehow succeed to uh, acquire this jurisdiction in a way that the feudal authorities don't fight. I, is that, is that, that's, my, that's my understanding of what he was saying, that uh, there were, they would like try to, to get ways of getting property the feudal authorities would would resist or and not allow them to exercise that. But there was something about the form of a trust that weakened the resistance of the of the secular authorities over this element of, of the church jurisdiction, and that so then the trust blooms in the West as a as a as a uh, legal concept and organization as as a a way to harmonize the interests of the church and the and the feudal aristocracy. One of the big um, benefices that happened that I'm going to be researching more because it's going to be relevant to the research that I'm doing is when a lord or a noble gave land to a monastery. One of the main things that the monastery was seen as giving back to that noble was prayer for that noble and their family in perpetuity. So the fact that that monastery stays there and keeps those same traditions is somehow related to the contract or the trust that the noble is, is putting in them, right? So if, if a noble says, I have a lot of excess money and I don't know exactly what I'm gonna do with it, I'm gonna put it in this thing that's going to have a life past my own and far into the future, right? And I'm not sure, you know, that obviously immediately reminds me of Timur Kran's stuff on Islam and the waqf, where his idea is that the, the structure of a waqf or the way that their kind of per perpetual trust um, that you could you could uh, develop for academic or or philanthropic reasons um, was too rigid, and it would it would lead to their lack of ability to adapt in the long run. But I don't know exactly. It seems like the trusts that are being talked about here are less rigid, even though they have the same idea that there's something that you can build that lasts long term because the trust is put in it and that, that it will it will last in perpetuity. Do you have an interest in reading what he says about the evolution of towards this trust idea and try to understand what the dynamics are that are leading it to be somehow stable? Which That's pages? 235. It's actually in the section about inheritance. And uh, he talks about uh, at, the, at the top of the page, the feudal law resisting the devise of land. Uh, 
for charitable and non-charitable purposes. So there's a feudal interest in keeping land consolidated and in, feud and in military power, right? And he doesn't say this here, but one of the theories of why feudal land is structured the way it is, is that if you break it into pieces, you can't guarantee that you have the wealth that's required to create military might, right? So you, 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 you need to have loyal people who have enough independence and wealth to, to be a military, et cetera. And then the, the reciprocal duties that create, um, you know, people, you give land and they give you military service. So they, there's this resistance in separating the land. But then he says in the paragraph in the middle, in the case of devises to the church, the would-be testators found various ways to circumvent the prohibition. So then it goes through an evolution. One was a gift of land to a religious corporation with reservation of a life estate in the donor. This was a kind of inter vivos gift, or I think between people living, which was at the time permitted, but it had the same effect of a will. So I think, um, what are you understanding that to be saying there? It's a, it's a gift of land. Instead of, instead of an actually a, a will and testament, it's, it's while you're alive, you give this thing. Yeah. So it seems like the idea of the modern idea of a, a living will, where we're, you're doing is you're giving up the right to the land prior to death shortly before so that the transfer actually happens while you're still alive. So it's not seen as like bequeathing it to someone that's not under like the inheritance law. I think that's my understanding. I think I'm understanding this and what you're saying. And then it says that the feudal authorities didn't like it. They prohibited gifts of land to religious bodies. So it's not permitted. You just can't give them. You just can't, no, no gifts. The second uh, scheme they tried, uh, the landholder would not give the land, but would surrender it to the religious corporation to be held by it as a feudal lord. And the transfer continued to occupy it as a vassal. So instead of a gift, uh, he, they, he say, you're my Lord and you, you hold this thing and I'm your vassal. Um, and then after the death was, was, took place, um, there was no one to enter into a claim against the religious corporation. Uh, a third possibility was that the land was leased to the religious corporation for a thousand years. That was quickly not permitted. And the final thing hit upon was the trust, the use. Title to the land was conveyed to a lay person to be held by him as a trustee for the religious corporation, which after the donor's death would have the use of the land and the right to all profits derived from it. And provision was made for new trustees to succeed the trustee who died. Such uses had been widely utilized since the 12th century um, that had forbidden uh, and for the benefit of religious orders. Oh, that were forbidden to own property in the first place. So I guess you have Franciscans who can't own property. Um, you put it in trust you, in any kind of gift you give is in trust for their, for their benefit. It looks like they expand that, that to all kind of religious give, uh, benefices to the church. Eventually this became a means not only of conveying land for charitable purposes during a landholder's lifetime, but also of establishing what was in effect a charitable bequest or device. So how does like, that how does that resolve the problem? Why isn't there a counter response by the feudal? It interest? seems to limit the uh, actions taken or available to the religious organizations sufficiently that the feudal. Uh, my guess is the feudal lords wouldn't fight it because of the the uh, greater availability of checks there. So you have the constant reinstatement of trustees over the land. So you have some kind of check there. And then if I'm correct on my understanding of how trusts work, trusts also come with um, provisions or can have provisions on how they're used. Yeah. And so the creation of a trust that limits the options of religious organizations maybe gives feudal lords uh, more confidence that people are going to control them or the trusts are going to limit the potential excesses of religious use or um, whatever fear they have of, of religious organizations holding the land 
are alleviated because of the um, ability that you have of the trust to uh, make specifications on how that trust will be used. Um, that also might tie into what Marcus was saying about the giving of land in exchange for um, having monks pay for your the, the Lord uh, in perpetuity is that might be something that they can put in clauses in the trust. So that gives them um, a greater ability to have credible commitment in exchange for something like the, the duration of the trust. So without the trust, the monks can just stop praying for the person who uh, gave the property to the monastery. But then if you have the trust and they're bound by the trust, then they're basically committed to offering religious services to the, the donor and their family, something like that. Yeah, he, he says this on 239 or something supporting what you're saying, that a trust is understood as a property with a purpose. He gives a German word for it that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, Zwecksvermogen, property for a purpose. But at the bottom of that page, something I wasn't understanding, he, he was saying that trust or a use or a trust in English presupposes three parties, a donor, a donee, and a beneficiary. Uh, the donee took the gift as a trustee for the beneficiary. So I've understood that so far. You have a donor, give it to the donee. The donee holds it as in trust for the beneficiary. Normally, however, property given to an ecclesiastical corporation was owned by the corporation. It was the donee. Nevertheless, it was also the beneficiary. So I, and you think about people who put their, their property in trust and then they make the, the beneficiaries, the trustees. So it's like you, you have to do certain things you know, you have to do certain things legally with the trust. You, just, you can't do certain, uh, you know, there's, there, there's rules, there's property with a purpose, but then you you can withdraw it and make decisions as the trustee for yourself. It's kind of a an odd <laughs> circumvention. Like, of what... I, I had, um, like when I was a kid, I think my grandparents gave some money in a trust for me for education purposes or something like that, right? So I'm the trustee and the beneficiary in that case, right? because I would be taking it out for, for very particular purposes. But to the, the one system that he doesn't talk about that I'm aware of, but I don't understand yet, is the system of patronage. So the, 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 the somebody, a, a Lord might grant land to a monastery or to the church and then have these clauses of prayer and perpetuity, et cetera. But um, throughout the monastery's life, they also seemed to have a patron or someone actively supporting them that might be where this bargain was sort of struck between um, the church and the state in this case, in that the church is allowed to have their canon law and to have, to, they're, they're given these benefices in ways that the, the, the king or the nobility or the other, other feudal authorities might not like, but they're also still enveloped in some other larger system where they're given a patron or they always have some patron that's watching over them responsible, make sure they don't step out of these lands or these bounds. So that, that the purpose of the primogeniture system, which is to keep large land holdings together, isn't broken up because the beneficence system is counteracted by the patronage system. I might so, be totally wrong there because that might not be how the patronage system works. But if I understand you're saying that on some level, if the law of trusts is a secular in the secular domain, there's still some check on the power of the church. Is that yes. the of what you were saying? Or because if our puzzle is is why does the the feudal authority allow all these gifts to be given if it like just dissolves them very quickly, right? Um, it might be because that there there still is a sort of hey I gave you this trust I gave you this land our family gave you this land and you and we're um, and so you still owe something to us or you're still responsible to us somehow I don't entirely know but the pattern in England at least, over time, is that more and more monasteries were made patrons of, um, or that the, the, that the king was the patron of monasteries many, many, um, as, as, as time went on. So as, this, as the central authority got bigger, he was also the patron of more uh, monasteries. Oh, I had a phone, I lost it, but yeah.
the, it, it should be said that one of the things that Berman emphasizes in the this penultimate chapter that we we're talking about is that um, in the 11th century, the church for the first time identified itself as a corporation and had an interest in, dis, in developing an understanding of corporate law or the law of a corporation as a means of constitutional self-governance and as a way to organize its jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis other, other jurisdictions or non-ecclesiastical corporate entities. Um, and that, that, that development of corporate law uh, has its influence today, right? And what what um, and that's why they he brings up uh, F W Maitland in this chapter so much I think because um, Alan McFarlane I haven't read his work in too much detail but I've I've watched a lot of his lectures talks that he says that he's basically taking on from Maitland saying that what made England unique was they took that trust idea or he just Maitland just calls it the trust idea meaning that you can have corporations or you can have these bodies that aren't just simply one of the nobility's properties, but they also aren't like just um, royal property. They're their own bodies operating in their own way. And that those bodies are able to have some sort of social sway. So people could just come together and form a corporation and that does something. So that one of the prime examples was um, Lloyd's of London and like the early insurance, um, you know, sort of market and insurance industry was formed from people recognizing we all have a common interest that we can invest in and make something that lasts beyond us, right? Or that that it's th that this body or this spirit that we're creating right now will last beyond our death, and um, and that that idea hooked in England in a way that it didn't in other places, and and made English society more robust, perhaps to the the, the tumult of um, of the modern era. He uh, emphasizes on 219, some of the qualities of what the church contributed to this idea of a corporation as distinct from the Roman that kind of gives maybe, and I, what you were saying was maybe think about this. And one of the interesting things about making like a stock exchange is that you can make rules for yourself that are binding. You can make rules for your members. On 219, it talks about how uh, the Romans had a sense that only a corporation that was given a legal privilege by another entity uh, could be a corporation, whereas the canon law, any group of persons which had the requisite structure and purpose constituted a corporation without special permission. Secondly, um, the Roman view was that um, the public corporation could create new law for its members. Um, let's see, they reject, the Romans rejected that, whereas the, the, the canon for canon law any corporation could have a legislative and judicial jurisdiction over its members, which is very important for the idea of, of self-government or non-governmental non forms of governance. Uh, third, the Roman view was that a corporation uh, could only act through its representatives or could act through its representatives and not necessarily uh, assemble or an ensemble of its members. The canon law required consent of members um, in various types of situations. So there's some kind of uh, greater connection between the agent and, and principal. And the fourth, the church rejected the Roman maxim that what pertains to the corporation does not pertain to its members. So this idea of kind of limited liability is in the Romans. But for the canonists, the property of the corporation is the common property of its members, uh, but that it, this also means that in some respects, the corporation could tax its members uh, as a means of paying debts. That you that you're in some way responsible both both that the, the corporation can't use the property without your consent on some level that it is your corporate property uh, but on the other hand the debts of the corporation are somehow uh, responsibilities of the individuals and that I don't think that's that's true of corporate you know limited liability corporations today should we uh, start to debrief this conversation or yeah, let's do it. I was just gonna say, I think that corporations idea is one of the focuses in seed and top. It's, it either is one of the focuses in seed and top or one of the things he doesn't talk about. I don't remember which, but yeah. I know it's one of those. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. either does or does not talk about it with certainty. I will hold that yes. to yes. join proposition. Yes. <laughs> Good. What what did we do that uh that helped us understand and make sense of what was going on?
Um, I think, okay, just this is a quick note for next time. I think what I need to do is um, take these sections that I'm going to read out of the book or, or like quotes that I want to read and take them out, copy them, put them somewhere else. Because in the middle of talking, I was scattering around a little bit too much. But that's just, that's, that's a matter of preparation, I guess. A point for improvement. So you're, you were yes. trying to find things that you couldn't. Yes. Well, I found the same thing. I found it last week and this week too. It's like, there's actually so many pages to read. It's only so much time I want to put into preparation. So I'm putting notes in the book, but then I'm definitely missing things that I, that I might want to otherwise bring up. And the question is how much preparation do I want to make for, for presenting it as a, you know, very coherently and systematically. Do, you, do you, can we just talk about that? How well do you think we each did in terms of presenting what the chapter was about? I think you all both did very well at presenting and, and guiding the discussion, um, moving things along. Um, I felt like a little bit behind on that, but I, I lost my notes for what I was supposed to be presenting. And so I was kind of scrambling a little bit. Um, so hopefully that'll all be cleared up by next time. You, you, you mentioned that before about losing the notes, so we kind of knew yeah. it. We knew it. So, uh, but can you say what what things we did that you did think helped us? Because it's, it's kind of a weird double role because it's for us to remember things that we read a long time ago. You know, we read read them at different times, and then to some degree, if if and to the degree people are really interested in watching, who haven't read, we want to bring them on board of what's what's there to be found out and give them context for what we're talking about. And I don't. We we should have other people tune on to tell us how much sense this is making to them. But how, what are we doing that you think is helping us in achieving those objectives? Or it's helpful by outlining the the chapter or hitting some of the major themes, um, bracketing our discussion enough that we're not hopping too much all over the book and kind of taking it like Berman takes it and and moving chapter by chapter. And so I think that's something we struggled with last time is we kind of went all over the place and, and kind of lost this movement through different ideas to get somewhere. And so I think that outlining what we're talking about and then talking about it and then moving on to the next point has helped a lot. Yeah, because there are a lot of, there are a lot of like really powerful nuggets at certain spots where you're like, oh, that's a really interesting fact I didn't know before, but it's very important to tie them together in a bow at the end and sort of forcing somebody to make a small outline of each chapter forces you to realize those themes that you wouldn't have realized otherwise and he he does organize his themes somewhat but he almost organizes them he he, he says them in a very strange way it's the last two pages of every chapter are very like reflective always mm -hmm. but that's and also looking forward good writing and making yeah. comments that relate to yeah. what's coming up yeah yeah i'd say the okay the the maybe the one uh, piece of criticism is for Andrew is like two or three times you like posed a question to us and we weren't sure if it was a, a real question or not because I and uh, like I, I I get the question in a sense but you know, the way you asked the question and then we were like oh well do you want us to solve like the ma biggest problem in the universe like <laughs> uh, you want you think we have an answer but yeah I do I get I yeah. do if you, yeah um, <laughs> yeah yeah. Maybe we do. So, yeah. so you're saying be clearer if I'm if I'm trying to formulate what I understand the problem to be rather than necessarily asking a question. Yeah. Or or don't overestimate our ability to answer those big questions. But either one of those, yeah. I don't I don't have the notion that we are going to solve everything, but I mm -hmm. do want I my interest sometimes, and I'm not think I don't think this is necessarily the case in that the one I'm thinking about, but I do want to put the big things out there that get us to synthesize things to a higher level of understanding that we had from independent reading. So I want to put out the big things to see what you guys can help me understand about them, if that makes sense. Or Not what the, we've, what our Venn diagram of what we've read doesn't match up, you know? Right. Well, it helps us get on the same page, but also the Venn diagram, it pulls things in, we move things from the out, outer parts into the part in the middle, right? And it's my sense of the dialogue is um, where we're cooperating is to create that synthesis that we were talking about earlier in, in the sense of a kind of an open-ended system that, that uh, we're working on a big project, but then we try to figure out the particulars. So per perhaps a way to deal with the really big, big questions is to try to get particular again and try to induce from particulars to the bigger, 
the bigger ideas and not, not just say, what do we do with this big idea, but let's get into the particulars of the text to see that relate to it. And we may never get to the biggest thing. You know, we it's very much like a Socratic dialogue, questions about what is justice. And then you get to the end and you're like, where was the answer? Well, we didn't answer that, but we achieved a lot on the way to it. Mm -hmm. So I, that was yeah. my hope and goal. I'm not, not sure I'm doing I mean, that as well as I, mean, I could, so, but. Because sometimes I would feel like I do have a direct answer, but it's like, it's almost like off topic in that like, okay, so what can we do to reinfuse the Western legal tradition with its original spirit? I don't know, become a Christian or something. <laughs> Just tell people to become Christian. But that, but if that worked, it would have been done more effectively already. You know, there's plenty of people over the last century that have been telling people become Christian. It didn't work. And I don't think that's where, what, what Berman is. Uh, yes. I don't think that really either. Yeah. It, it's um, not, it's not totally clear what his stance is with respect. He, he thinks that his historical analysis is mm -hmm. true. That's what he's writing about, but it's not totally clear what he thinks. He thinks something is missing, but it's not clear if he actually thinks that the Christian doctrines and faith are true in some sense. And so his stance with respect to that is ambiguous. And that's probably the big, that's, that's, th this is like a whole, s seemingly like a whole literature, like modern people talking about how important Christianity was and how indispensable it is to the way that the institutions that we take for granted today or the way of life we take for granted today. And then just sort of being ambiguous on what that means about what to do next. So, and I guess a lot of us have been reading out of that. Like the Seed and Top book is in that. Um, Tom Holland book is in that literature. Tom Holland is still alive and, and, and Seed and Top is alive, but he's very old, but Holland is still alive and is actually like his public, um, what do you call it? He, like his public, uh, public presence is very much talking like getting people think about this question like should you sort of return or not should you return to the faith or not i don't know so does that was the practical suggestion i made a kind of a uh, a resolution on some level of because when we if I, if I ask a big question can we see if we can turn to the particulars to see what raises the question and and what might start to ask it, answer it by induction, but not necessarily ultimately and completely. I'll try not to ask too many of those because, you know, I, did, I would say what I thought went well is I did, I was understanding the question of principle better from our mm -hmm. conversation and trying to see, I, I had new insight about the relationship between the inductive elements and how it might, how Western legal tradition might be a, a prototype of law, for example, from that conversation. And I thought that came out of us looking at the particulars and trying to see how they related to one another, make those connections. Uh, I think maybe to improve, I'm not sure exactly what the improvement is, but I was a little bit more worried about time, a little bit more worried about giving uh, context and explaining things. So, uh, and I don't think it flowed as smoothly as our past, as our last conversation. So I, I was La the last one was over less material and there was more to unpack this one we could take more things for granted so we had to get more into particulars that stopped and started and stuff so that's going to be kind of natural i think yeah time management was a problem though because i think our, our first chapter was like an hour second chapter was like 45 minutes and the last two chapters were like 30 minutes and so there, it, there's probably also an uneven distribution of what was good about each of those chapters. And so maybe that was a fair distribution. Um, but figuring out, we should hopefully have like some kind of goal that we're shooting for for each chapter ahead of time. And then hopefully just move there more naturally. It's like we were writing we like child really big at first. And then as we get close to the side of the page, we start writing. We start, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John Mulaney has a bit about that. Yeah. Um, I think that's definitely but, going on. I, I, I do think on a, to a small degree, the first two chapters have more thematic general ideas. And then the last two were much more detailed about particulars of the, the nature of what was in the law, which is harder to talk about uh, kind of Socratically. But also we were definitely, we're not keeping track. Do you have any suggestions? Do you think, do you think we, how do we, how do we do a better job of that next time? Maybe ahead of the time, we just kind of, knowing how general or how detailed each chapter is 
have an estimation. Cool. And then maybe if we have uh, a chat open, we can say, let's shoot for closing this up in five minutes. I think just do, let's so, do it verbally, but I think you're right. If we estimate what we want to spend, then we can say, then someone, we're all kind of authorized to say, hey, Kevin, we're coming up on the time. Do we want to spend another five minutes on this or move on? Yeah. I think that makes okay, a lot yeah. of sense to me. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Good. So Thanks. next time the we're at the chapter that we read is a more historical in character. It's the Henry the Second versus Beckett. So I'm I'm very excited for that one. I think that's going to be fun to read, and uh, I'm very interested in that affair. And there's a great movie about it, which I guess I'll I'll link next time. But um, yeah, I think that's Jacob's favorite movie. I think our friend Jacob. Um, yeah. Okay. So. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Let's talk two minutes after the call. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.